Today is Tuesday, October 18th, and this is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. This week, earlier this week I should say, my wife showed me a video that was sent from her sister who lives in Scotland uh, because our niece, who's I think around 18 years old now, was baptized because she, as an 18-year-old, made the personal decision to accept Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And being a non-Catholic and having not been baptized as an infant, she's being baptized now as a teenager because she finally made the choice to be a Christian. And this is how evangelicals look at baptism. Baptism is a sign that marks someone, they say, as a true Christian. Baptism is a sign that one has been born again. My niece was not baptized as an infant because they would say she's not a Christian. Because in order to become a Christian, a person needs to make a personal decision to have Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And since an infant cannot make a personal decision of that kind, they say that it's not appropriate to baptize the child because the child has not chosen to be a Christian. And so the child is left unbaptized. And I've never really thought much about this. But having this come up in discussion between my wife and I, and watching a video of this non-denominational evangelical baptism ceremony, my head started spinning by the apparent contradictions and confusion in the evangelical life. And I'd like to talk about this a little bit because what I, what I find is that Catholics in the modern world are pressured to befriend evangelicals as brothers and sisters in Christ. The Catholic Church teaches this in the Catechism. I'm not objecting to that. And in fact, I thank God for my niece's baptism. The Catholic Church teaches that a baptism that's performed according to the traditional mode of baptism by pouring water upon the person or or immersing the person in water and saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is true and valid baptism. It's Christian baptism. So I'm I'm happy about that. I'm I'm not critical of, of any of that. Everything that my niece has done is good. But what makes my head spin is this messaging, this lifestyle of evangelicals, because 
what they say and what they do are completely at odds with one another. It's very bizarre. And this event of my niece's baptism has really caused this to to distract me, as it were. And I'd like to talk about it a little bit because I think it helps us to understand what's essentially wrong with non-Catholic Christianity or evangelicalism in this case. As I said before, we're, we're challenged by the Church to treat Protestants or non-Catholic Christians as our brothers and sisters in Christ because of their baptism. And we share some things in common. We believe some things in common, although I think that it's a lot less than it appears on the surface. We could say, for example, that we both believe in the Bible, and that's partially not true because we don't have the same contents in Catholic and Protestant Bibles. We can say that we both believe in the Apostles' Creed, and that's only partially true, because the interpretation of the words of the Creed is not the same among Catholics and non-Catholic Christians. There's really not a whole lot that we do share in common when you begin defining terms and interpreting things that are written. The the similarities are quickly found to be superficial and not real. And yet, nevertheless, we understand that the Church teaches us that any baptism carried out according to the formula for baptism in the Catholic Church is accepted as or recognized as valid baptism. When my wife, for example, who was baptized as an evangelical, entered the Catholic Church, she wasn't required to be baptized the right way. Her baptism was recognized by the Church So it's true that the Church recognizes evangelicals as true Christians. But as I said, when we get beyond the words of the text and and start to talk about their meanings, we find that the the apparent like-mindedness disappears. And we won't be able to talk about things for long before disagreements begin manifesting themselves. And one of the most glaring disagreements has to do with baptism. In the Catholic Church, a Catholic mother barely gets through delivery before she's thinking about arranging the baptism of her child. It's the desire of a Catholic mother to have her baby baptized as soon as possible because of what baptism offers to the child On the other hand, the evangelical mother gives birth to the child and has no interest in baptism, will even refuse baptism if it's presented to the child. How can two systems of faith be said to be similar when they take contrary positions in the very first 
decisions of life. The very first step of the Catholic life and of the evangelical life are opposites. These are two very different systems of beliefs. As we can see in the experience of a Catholic infant and an evangelical infant. And what's bizarre is that the evangelical parents actively deny baptism to their child. And if we ask, why would you deny baptism to your child? They will say, because baptism is a sign that one has chosen to follow Jesus Christ. One has chosen to become a Christian. And when one makes that choice, one is baptized and one cannot be baptized before one chooses to become a Christian. Now, when we hear that, we may say, oh, okay, okay. I see what you're saying. It's your conviction that becoming a Christian is a matter of one's free will and no religion can be imposed on a child without the consent of that child's free will. So you would never baptize the child when the child isn't even able to read or speak, has no idea what the gospel even is. You would never impose baptism upon that child. You, you can't impose Christianity upon a child without the consent of the child's will. It has to be the child's choice. Okay, I understand what you're saying. That's fine. Very different from the Catholic view but I'll respect your position. I'll respect your belief that the Christian faith should not be imposed upon a child without the consent of that child's will. Fine, I can respect that. We can imagine a conversation like that and things would seem fine. It would seem like that makes perfect sense. I don't agree, but I understand. It's plausible. And we can point out Bible verses that say, believe and be baptized and things like that. We can show that believers chose to be baptized, we can see that a plausible argument could be made from sacred scripture that one should be baptized only when that person expresses the desire freely to be baptized as a Christian. Okay, we can see that conversation. And imagine that these two families became friends and stayed in touch As soon as the child began to grow, in fact, even before, we would begin to notice some strange contradictions about what the parents said, about the reasons the parents gave for not baptizing their child. First of all, it's going to be very likely that the child has already been given a Christian name. The child may be named 
after a Bible character or a famous Christian from history. The child may be named Isaiah or Jeremiah or Joshua or Daniel. And the parents may say, we named our child after our favorite Bible character, Joseph. So the child may have a Christian name. Even though the parents adamantly oppose the idea of imposing the Christian faith upon the child. They, they don't feel any, any trouble with imposing a Christian name upon the child. The child is brought home and the child's nursery is probably decorated with Christian images. The nursery is a Christian nursery. The child may have a stuffed animal. The child may have some toys to play with, maybe even some baby books to flip around with. The parent may put on some music for the baby to listen to. Maybe put on a video for the baby to watch, and almost certainly all of these things chosen by the parent for the baby will be Christian. It will be Christian music. It will be a Christian story, a Christian video, and so on. All of this Christian culture will be imposed on the baby, even though the baby has not chosen to be a Christian. After the parents are home and the mother has recovered, the family will go to church and they'll dress the baby up, put the baby in the carrier and bring the baby to a Christian church. The baby will be raised and brought to the Christian church every Sunday. Christian church attendance will be imposed on the baby, on the child, even though the child has not made a personal decision to be a Christian. A Christian name. Christian nursery images and sounds. Christian church attendance. All of these are imposed upon the infant despite the fact that the child has not chosen to become a Christian. However, baptism is denied to the child because the child has not chosen to become a Christian. And we can see that there's a clear contradiction in what's going on. The child then grows a little more up through the toddler ages and as the child begins to talk and move and walk and play the parents will begin to teach the child to pray. The parents will teach the child to kneel down or sit down, to fold his hands, to close his eyes and pray. And the parents will teach the child to pray to the Christian God. The parents will say, Okay, little Joseph, let's pray. 
say, Thank you, God, for my food. Please bless me and make me healthy. In Jesus' name, amen. And the child will repeat those words and get a pat on the head and then be handed his snack. Prayers to the God of the Christian faith are imposed upon this child even though this child has not made a decision to be a Christian. Now, if relatives visit and one of these relatives practices a different religion and the relative says, oh, well, would you mind if I taught Joseph, little Joseph here, one of my prayers from my religion? Before we eat, we give thanks to Allah for our food and our health. Would you mind if I teach our family's prayer to Allah, to little Joseph here? And the Christian parents would say, No, we don't want our child to be taught to pray to Allah. Our child is taught to pray to the God of the Christians. If that Muslim friend or relative were to say, why are you imposing Christian religion on your child? Don't you believe that your child should be free to grow up ask his own questions, study, and choose a religion for himself? The Christian parents will not say the same thing that they said when they denied that child baptism or when they taught him to say his prayers to the Christian God. The Christian parents will be stuck, but they will say something like, No, we're a Christian family, and we're raising our children in the Christian faith. We are essentially imposing the Christian religion on our children, even though they have not made a decision to be a Christian. However, we have refused our children baptism because they have not chosen to be a Christian. And here we see this glaring, mind-boggling self-contradiction. Of all things, of all things, how has baptism been singled out as the one thing to be denied to the child? Of all things, the prayer before snack time is imposed on the child. The Christian music in the nursery is imposed. Christian church attendance is imposed. All these things are imposed upon the child except for baptism. Bizarre. So let's go on. Little Joseph gets through that event with the visiting Muslim relatives and has mommy keep him safe from having anything other than the Christian religion imposed on him as he grows up. And he comes to age five or six, and it's time to go to school, and so his parents choose to send him to a Christian school. He's sent to a Christian school, 
even though he has not chosen to be a Christian. A Christian education is now imposed on little Joseph. And so he goes to a Christian school where he is taught by Christian teachers. He is allowed to read from Christian books. He has to sing Christian songs. He has to pray Christian prayers, participate in Christian activities, celebrate Christian holidays. All these things which his parents consider to be the value of sending him to a Christian school. What makes Christian schooling important for his parents is that they would like to have the Christian religion and Christian culture and Christian education imposed upon their child. But not baptism. Baptism is the one thing, the one thing that for some reason they do not believe should be imposed on a child because the child has not made a personal decision to follow Jesus Christ. Little Joseph, whose name is taken from the Christian Bible, who is brought to a Christian church every Sunday, sent to a Christian school, given Christian books to read, allowed to listen to Christian music, allowed to watch Christian movies, not allowed to be taught religions by, or prayers or anything by members of other religions, this little Christian-ish boy has all of these elements of Christian culture imposed upon him by his parents, but for some reason, these evangelical parents deny their child baptism. Very strange. The child grows up, gets older, gets into middle school, and is interested in dating. And his parents impose upon him rules of the Christian faith, rules of Christian morality. Those are the rules of the household which are imposed upon this boy. He's allowed to do this, not that. He's rewarded for this. He's punished for that. And the explanation for the rewards and punishments for the rules and standards are all Christian. He is accountable to Christian moral standards. The moral standards of the Christian faith are imposed on this boy even though he has not made a personal decision to be a Christian. And this goes on and continues and goes on and continues until maybe at some point this child makes the decision to identify as a Christian. This child who has listened to Christian music, attended Christian school, said Christian prayers, celebrated Christian holidays, responded to a Christian name, been subject to Christian moral standards all through his life, may now choose to become a Christian. As if his 
childhood was a dream, was irrelevant, as if none of that counts. And for some reason, for some reason, real Christianity cannot begin until the child makes the personal decision to have Jesus to be his Lord and Savior. And then, let's say at age 18, the child decides that he would like to make this decision. And so he informs his parents that I would like to make my decision, I would like to be baptized, and his parents will rejoice because their son has finally chosen to become a Christian, even though he has lived as a Christian his entire life. And so the parents excitedly share the news with their evangelical pastor and their evangelical Christian friends, and they schedule the day for the child's baptism. And when all is said and done, the child is baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The child receives true Christian baptism. Here's my question. Why was that baptism not simply given to the child as an infant? Why was that baptism not given to the child as an infant? Now, the Protestants will say, well, baptism is a sign of one's being born again. And yet, if we were to ask this being born again, when did that take place? No one may have an answer. There may be no answer to that question, when did this spiritual rebirth take place, which is being signified after the fact by this ceremony of baptism. And no one will likely be able to identify a time when this took place. But for some reason, at this time, because the child has asked for it, Everyone is excited and happy, and the child is given a Christian baptism. Now, when we, when we share that story, it sounds great. And we could say, well, you know, if it ends well in the end, who cares? This doesn't prove anything about baptism either way. The child who is baptized at birth and the child who is baptized at age 18, they both have the same baptism. They both had Christian education. They both were taught to pray like Christians. They both were taught to observe Christian moral standards. They both were protected from other religious teachings. When all is said and done, they both stand in a similar place, at least on the surface, we might say. But that's only true of the child for whom this decision was made. For many more of the children, the opposite decision will be made. 
for most of the children, the decision to become a Christian and be baptized independently will not be chosen. And they will move on into adult life without being baptized. And they will not be baptized because their parents believed that one should only be baptized if he chooses to be so. The child will go into adult life possibly moving away from his parents, from his Christian parents, moving away from the Christian family, out of the Christian school, away from the Christian music, out into the world, and he's not baptized. This will be the case for every evangelical child whose parents chose to not baptize him as a child. And we may ask, well, what's the difference if it was a Catholic child? What would the difference be if it was a Catholic child? Okay, so he's baptized, but what if he chose to not follow the faith of his parents? What if he leaves the church? What if he goes out into the world? What if he, what if he chooses to go his own way like the prodigal son? What, what good will his baptism be then? He was baptized and didn't even choose to be baptized. So they end up in the same condition. Is that really true? Is that really true? Do they really end up in the same condition? I don't think they do. <clears throat> Let's follow these two children into their adult life. One goes off into his early 20s. A young man who was raised in a Christian family, sent to a Christian school, made to pray Christian prayers, taught Christian songs, held accountable to Christian moral standards, and yet was not baptized because he was told, you're not a Christian. The other kid goes out into the world stops going to church, no longer says his prayers, but he does so knowing that he was baptized as an infant. He takes that baptism with him into adult life. And let's grant the evangelical position and say, it's just a sign. It's just a sign. One child takes that sign with him into his adult life. And in his mind, his parents and God and the priest who celebrated the baptism offered to him the sign of fellowship. They offered to him the sign of membership in the Christian church before he had done anything, before he had made any decision. They received him unconditionally as a member of the Christian family. <clears throat> the other child looks back and sees that his parents did not recognize him as a member 
of the Christian family, but denied him the sign of membership in the Christian family. From his birth, while the one child has been welcomed and received as a member of the Christian family, he has been rejected and denied, refused as a member of the Christian community. And now here he is, walking in disobedience in the world. Do you really believe that those two, chil- that those two young adults are in the same position, spiritually, mentally, psychologically? Do you really believe they have received the same message, the same thing? Do you really believe there's no advantage? And again, this is just based on granting that baptism is nothing but a sign, nothing but a ceremony. Even if that's the case, even if we grant that, one received that sign and was welcomed. The other was denied that sign and was rejected. You honestly believe that those two young adults have the same feelings about their relationship to the Christian faith? They don't. They don't. We can tell a nice story when the child does make a decision to be baptized. But what about all the children who don't choose to be baptized? The Catholic children who walk away from the faith of their parents always know that they were welcomed. And much more than that. They know that their parents and the Catholic Church teach that when they were baptized, they were adopted as children of God through the sacrament of baptism. They know that God forgave them for the guilt of original sin. They have been taught that they received benefits through that baptism which remain theirs forever. Those benefits were given to them freely at birth and they can never be taken away from them. That Catholic child goes into adult life regardless of his decisions, knowing that God has reached out to him and blessed him without him making any decision about anything. And that he has chosen to walk away from those benefits in the same way that the prodigal son walked away from his generous, loving father. And that Catholic child is told, if at any time you wish to return, you're you're welcome. You were welcome before you did anything. You were welcome the day you were born. You will always be welcome. You will always be a member of God's family because you've been baptized. God was gracious to allow you to be born to parents who had you baptized. God's grace was present not in a message from a preacher, but in your very parents, in your family life. God gave you a Christian family. And through your Christian family, you received the gift of baptism 
and the benefits conferred by that baptism, and they're yours forever. You will always be a member. You will always be a member. The certificate of your baptism will always be in the records of the Catholic Church forever. And any time that you wish to return, you're welcome back home. And if you make bad decisions and choose to commit sins and offend God by your behavior, you do that freely. And yet you are welcome back. And the way back is very simple. The door is always open. You can come at any time. All that you need to do is visit a local priest and tell that priest that you would like to come home again. That you have sinned and made bad decisions. You're sorry for them and you'd like to return. And the priest will tell you that all that you need to do is make a good confession. And you're welcome home as if you had never left. As if you had never left. That's the message of Catholicism. You're a member of the family. You always have been a member of the family. You're always welcome. And you'll be received when you return as if you had never left. That's a religion of grace. That is the religion of love and mercy. The religion learned by the evangelical child who didn't choose to be baptized is not a religion of love and grace. He was rejected from his birth. He was asked to obey the rules of his religion, though he was not recognized as a member of his religion. His whole life was a trial to test whether or not he should be admitted. And he left having never been admitted. And now he has to consider going to a community that has never acknowledged him to be a member, that refused to give him the sign of membership, and tells him that if he doesn't choose to follow the rules and make the right decision, he will not be a member. And he has never been a member. The evangelical message is nothing like the message of the prodigal son. And we can see in this that it's false. This idea to impose Christian culture on children, to impose Christian standards, to teach Christian prayers, to impose Christian education, all while denying the sign of Christian family membership is a is an unloving message what they actually do this is what i said at the beginning what they actually do contradicts everything that they say they do they talk about love and grace and free forgiveness and mercy and unconditional love and all of these things they talk about, but they practice 
exactly the opposite. The child is denied membership in the family of God because he hasn't made the decision. He hasn't done his part. He hasn't earned it. What, what is it other than requiring somebody to earn membership in God's family? What, what, what else is it? It's the opposite of everything they talk about. It's not grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is exactly what we see in the baptism of an infant. We see the clearest example of unmerited favor in the baptism of an infant. We see exactly the opposite in the denial of baptism to an infant. Why not baptize the child? He hasn't done what he needs to do yet. That's why. And this is the so-called salvation apart from works, by faith. And the Catholics who baptize their infants are said by the evangelicals to teach that salvation comes through works. What could be further from the truth? The Catholics baptize their infants. The evangelicals deny their children baptism. They say one thing, but they actually do the opposite. I can testify from experience as a kid who received baptism as an infant and was received into the Catholic Church as a child, though I had never made any decision to be a Christian. I was just a kid. I was loved by the teachers. I was welcomed by the priests, though I had done nothing. I never paid a dollar. I never did anything. When I was 18 years old, and as I went through my adult, my early adult life, the kindness, the generosity, the welcome of the Catholic Church drew me back. I knew that all I had to do was make a phone call I could walk in on any Sunday and I'd be welcome home. I knew that. It took me a while to get my head straight, but I knew that. That was never the issue. <clears throat> What's further or more confusing is that after a Christian makes this so-called decision to become a Christian and they receive the sign of baptism, they often fall away from the faith. They often fall into sin. They often stop going to church. And so there they are, wandering through the world, disobedient, even though they have received the sign of baptism. And no one, no one says he shouldn't have received baptism. He fell away. No one says he's going to need to get baptized again because that baptism he received wasn't obviously a real one. Because look at him. He's back in the world. He fell away. He's backsliding. He doesn't need to be baptized again. Everyone understands he was already baptized 
He simply needs to repent. And yet in the evangelical community, there's no real means of doing that. There's a sign for baptism, but there's no sign for returning home after falling away. And what would, if it's possible, if it's possible for a person to be baptized and fall away and return, why couldn't the evangelical have been baptized as an infant? It doesn't make any sense. And so we see evangelicals tormented throughout their adult lives by these questions about their salvation. They wonder, was I ever really born again? Because they don't believe that one is born again through baptism. So they're wondering if their decision or if their ceremony or if their change of life was sufficient. Was that really what it means to be born again? They look to their lives. They look for some experience to be what it means to be born again, rather than to their baptism. If you were baptized, you have been born again. Your baptism is the certainty of your being born again. The question of whether you were born again is not based on your experience. It's based on whether or not you've been baptized. If you were baptized, you were born again. If you were born, if you were baptized as an infant, you were born again as an infant. If you were baptized as an 18 year old, you were born again at your baptism as an 18 year old. If you fell away and abandoned the life of your infant baptism, you are a born-again, baptized Christian who has fallen into sin. And you need to be reconciled through the sacrament of confession. And when you go to confession, you will have the opportunity to meet with a priest to whom you can confess your sins, you can ask for counsel, and you can be sure that you are reconciled to God, and the priest will give you a sign of that reconciliation. The priest, on God's behalf, will say to you, I absolve you. You are forgiven. I don't know how an evangelical would ever be certain or assured of that forgiveness when he doesn't even know for sure if he's been born again. That uncertainty, that torment, which I know evangelicals live with, they talk about it all the time. How can I know if I'm saved? Is he saved? Is she saved? Am I saved? Was I ever born again? How can I know if I was born again? Evangelicals will speak confidently about how freely salvation comes. And yet, if you live with evangelicals, you'll know that they're tormented all the time by these questions, and their answers don't add up. They have no way to prove that they've been born again, unless they're going to what? 
point to their good works? We see the more we look at evangelicalism, it sure doesn't look like a religion that doesn't teach salvation by human works. We look for their, they look for their proof of being born again at their works. They look for their proof of forgiveness to their works. They look at proof of their salvation to their works. And they're not even sure if their baptism is real. Because after all, it's just a sign of something that supposedly took place. But they don't even know if that ever took place. Unless you get into some sentimentalism where they had some emotional experience. And they say, oh, surely, surely the emotion of that event proves that that was So that's what it really comes down to. Being born again is an emotional experience. This sure sounds like a shaky foundation. Catholicism does away with all of this uncertainty, manifests God's love and mercy, and makes forgiveness very clearly manifest by the sacrament of confession. What the Protestants do doesn't align with what they say. Denying their children baptism from the beginning preaches a religion that puts man on trial where a father refuses to accept a child until he proves himself to be worth accepting. And yet they talk about grace and forgiveness and how free and easy salvation is, that it's not dependent on works. And yet everything about the religion that they practice is about works. Children are asked to observe Christian moral standards before they're recognized as members of the Christian family. What could be clearer proof that one practices a religion where salvation is obtained through works than a religion that teaches a child to obey Christian rules before the child's even recognized as a member of the family. This isn't the case in Catholicism. In Catholicism, the children are received through the sacrament of baptism, are adopted as children of God, are forgiven for the sins committed by Adam and Eve, and are welcomed as members of God's family before they even open their eyes. Catholicism teaches that salvation is by grace and gives a child a stability and a simplicity growing up with a complete system of sacraments and education and formation that always assures a child that he is seen as a member of God's family, as one of God's children. And what the evangelicals do simply doesn't make any sense. There's no way to explain how we can preach that salvation is of grace and deny baptism to a child born into a Christian family.